Career high, career low. Mm. Career high. I think I started with career. I think the career high for me was 2012 when I managed to win the World Championships, and that was I'd been working with Steve Peters for a year, and I'd got I'd kind of like before that in 2011 I was ready to retire. Um, I'd had a lot going on off the table, and I just kind of just thought I've had enough, you know. Like like I say, I was I was ready for the exit door, um, ready to just give it all up really. Um, I was 35, most snooker players beyond 35 never really done much, so I thought, well if I'm not gonna do much and I'm feeling like this, I might as well try my hand at something else, you know. And then obviously met Steve Peters and then I kind of started playing well and enjoying it and competing and thinking, wow, this is, this is, I'm, I'm really getting any, a buzz out of this, but I wasn't getting the results. And come, f you know, Come like leading up to the World Championships, I was thinking like if, if I'm playing well and feeling good and not getting the results, maybe I've tipped over the edge of where I'm kind of done really, you know, even my good, my good game is probably not good enough to win, so is there any point in playing? Um, and then come the World Championships, I just remember I got on a practice table and the week before the World Championships I couldn't put a ball. I was getting whooped in practice, couldn't, you know, and, and, I, and I left my cue under the table, I went staying there and I didn't pick my cue up for a week. And then before I went to Sheffield, I went up there, got my cue, put it in the car, I thought, okay, see what happens, I had no expectations. I get to the Crucible, I felt good because I hadn't played for weeks, so I was like, you know, quite excited to play. Um, didn't want to burn myself out too much, playing crap the week before, basically. So I allowed myself that time off, get to Sheffield, started hitting the ball, the table was nice, boom, and then one day I come in, and everything was going in the middle of the hole. <laughs> I was like, what? what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? I was like, I've never felt this good on a table. And I said to Les Dodd, I said, I need a new tip, mate. And he put a tip on for me. And, I went, and he went, as a tip, I went, fantastic, mate. Tip might not have been, it was just the way I was hitting the ball. It was ripping, it was making such a good, and I thought, what is going on here? I was on the practice table for three hours a day because I was just enjoying playing so much. I thought, oh. And every time I got on the table, so like the World Championships is used like two sessions, three sessions, four session matches. So they're long games. So you, you can kind of lose it in one session, um, but you can't win it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's kind of like managing your bad sessions. And every match I had what I thought was a bad session, but they were four all. But when I, when I hit the money, it was seven one eight nil. So we'd it would be like four after the first session, and the guy's thinking, you know, we've jockeyed. You know, yeah. he's played well. I've played played all right. Four all, and I'm thinking, God, this could be a thirteen ten or a thirteen. This could go the distance. Next session, I went hundred ninety, hundred eighty, and again, and I thought, and it was just it, it was so quick. And I'd come off, and I think, wow, that was unbelievable. It was like I've been fired up with some sort of vaccine or something, I don't know what the hell. it's a good word to use there these days, vaccine, but I'd say it was like something had just been triggered in me. And I just, every match, I basically just played two or three brilliant sessions and, and basically no one got near me. And I was like, how did that happen? And then my little boy was up there and he was only like four or five at the time. And it was always one of my ambitions was to win a tournament, didn't have to be the world, but a tournament. And he came down and kind of shared the moment with me. Um, because obviously I wasn't, I wasn't with them. You know, I, I had to leave that family when I was two, so I kind of never really had that bond or that everyday bond where you wake up with your kids. So I kind of like, I missed out on that really. And, and and all I had was that if I do get to a final at all, maybe he could come and then share in that moment where it was me and him. And then when I won it in 2012 and I knew I was over the line, I got really emotional, but I thought I can't show any emotion here. You know what I mean? This is, my dad always said to me, if ever you win a tournament, you mustn't cry. And I had that in my head and I could feel myself welling up, but I didn't cry. And uh, and, then, and as I, oh, no, it's just, just the most un unbelievable feeling. And then little Ronnie come down there, I just, I was in that crucible, there's 980 people there. And I was felt like I felt like king. I felt like there's no feeling. I've never had a feeling like it in my life, because I just thought I've played the best snooker I could ever play. I've dominated this tournament. I've come from nowhere. I didn't put a ball for two years the previous. They was writing me off, and all of a sudden I've gone have some of that. <laughs> <laughs> have some of that. Put that in your archive. That's on YouTube for the rest of. <laughs> you tell me if there's any other snooker player that's won the world championship like that. No chance. You know. I, the nearest anyone got to me was six, seven frames. You know, it was just like, it was just, it was just, and that's not, that's not taking anything away from my opponents. Yeah. I just was, I was just too good. Yeah. Too good for too long. 
and uh, and it never felt easy. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't sit sitting there thinking I'm six up, five up, this is easy. I was on it. You know, I had to be on it all the time. And uh, and that was that was thanks to Steve Peters. You know, I never would have played that well for that long in that tournament and done it in that style without the help of him. So that for me was the most complete performance that any snooker player, you know, 17 days mm. in the World Championships. I, you know, maybe Hendry. But I don't even think Hendry would have in his prime been able to stay with me the way I was playing. And that's me being, being honest. That's, yeah. that's me, you know, fancying my chances against anybody that's ever, ever played this game. You know, on that form, I would have fancied I'd have come out on top. Mm. <laughs> Just a quick question. That's brilliant, by the way. Yeah. Getting goosebumps there. Yeah. Quick question before we move on to the career low. Mm. Why do you think your dad said to you, never cry if you win a tournament? He's a bit of a hard man. He's a bit of a hard man, you know. I think his, his upbringing, um, you know, he was a, you know, he had, he had a tough life, you know, he had a tough life. And I just think it's like, don't show no weakness. Never show any weakness. And that was what was drilled into me when I was younger. Don't show any weakness. You, you know, I don't want to see any emotion on you. If I come in the club, don't get the ump, don't get too excited. If you've won a tournament, it's history. It doesn't matter. It's about the next one. And I was like, I was only like nine or ten. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty like intense conversation, but it was all coming from from the right place. No one wanted me to be successful more than my dad. No one was more proud of me than my dad. Um, a lot of people would look at it and go, you know, don't you think that's a bit harsh for a nine, ten year old dad? Probably, but if I was to become the champion that I wanted to become, I've got to learn to be able to take that on board, deal with it, and at some point. Me and my dad kind of went, look, I'm better off without you now. And that, that happened at about 12. And when I say better off without you, like, don't come and watch me play. Stay at home, I'll ring you. Yeah, dad, I won 3 0, played good. That's it. I don't need, it wasn't beneficial for me having him in the room because I felt too much pressure to play the, the, the shots that I thought he wanted me to play. And um, he'd go, why'd you pop that? Why'd you do that? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do this? And in the end, I'm like, oh dear, I don't know. <laughs> Let me just play. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? So it kind of like, but he instilled this ability to perform under the most extreme pressure. And there was no pressure worse than having my dad watching me, criticising me, telling me I was no good, I was shit, everyone else is better than me, I needed to do this, I needed to do that, why did you play that shot? And in the end, I was like, I could play under that, but I didn't play to my true potential. And then one day, he stopped coming. He went, I've had enough, I'm not coming to watch you play. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll get a lift with one of the other parents. <laughs> I said, great, there's your 50 quid. <laughs> Have a good day, have a good weekend. So I get me 50 quid, someone will knock at the door, I got me, I thought, oh, this is great, I've got no pressure on me, no one's, no one's going to be telling me how, why have I gone for this shot and that shot. And I started getting to the last 16, I got to the, and then I won a tournament. And he come down about the quarterfinals, he went, you all right? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. He went, all right, and he just stood there, he didn't watch me play. He went, right, I'm going now, me and your mum are going out, so I was like, lovely. Anyway, I won my first Pro-Am, I was only 12. And the Pro-Am is where pros and amateurs can play in the same competition, but I was only 12. I wasn't even, you know, I was a junior. But not even, I was, it's like you had under 60, to, to be a junior, it was like an under 16 tournament. So I was, I was junior, junior. <laughs> and I ended up winning this Pro-Am, and I was like, how the hell have I done that? It's like I was beat the likes of Pete Rebden, Ken Dockett, who were pros by now. So they've got this little 12 year old, like, slapping their bums, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was thinking, this, this shouldn't be happening, right? And I got a cheque for £600, I got a trophy, and I thought, oh, that's it. If, I, if I'd never done anything after that, I'd have been so happy with just that moment. But looking back, that was like a bit of a freak, really, a freak thing to, to be able to do. So I think, yeah, you know, like learning to play under the extreme pressure that my dad kind of put me under, but it was all meant coming from the right place. And I just think, the reason why not to show an emotion was his upbringing, his toughness, and his way of dealing with things. And I love the way he deals with things. I, I, I wish I had more of that in me naturally, but like I said, I've had to work on that. And I am a bit softer, I am a bit more sensitive. And my dad is quite sensitive, it's just that he's a bit more able to just hold it down. Whereas me, I just pour it all out. So I'll do an interview and I'll just say, I'm in bits, I can't handle this, oh, we'll go. And everyone's like, he's mad, he's gone. <laughs> But I'm right, like an hour afterwards, but I just, I'm not very good at hiding my emotions, you know what I mean? So I've kind of had to learn that it's okay to let my emotions out, but then I also know that I'm a quick, 
I, I recover quite quick. So yeah. someone can think I'm down, but give me an hour, I'm a different person. I'm, like, I'm ready to go again. <laughs> so I think, you know, that's, um, that, was, that was, yeah, probably the reason why it, that kind of come from my dad. Um, but like I say, it was all meant in, 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 in a good way, if that makes sense, you know. Who wants to see a geezer win and just keep crying anyway? Uh, listen, when Federer does it, it's cute, because like, he's, he's, he's super cool, but um, if I was Swiss, maybe I could make that look good, but I'm not. I'd probably look like a sad, sad human being. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and you're right talking about your career low? Yeah, my career low. Because um, I've had so many. I've probably had m much more lows than I've had um, highs. It's only because because I think with the highs you kind of you kind of get into a rhythm of it and you kind of take it for granted. You know that you're in a good place, and it's like you know, yeah, you kind of like like I say, you you trained in a way, whereas it just sort of becomes like getting out of bed, brushing your teeth, da 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 da, and it kind of like all falls into place. Whereas my lows were just. <laughs> They were like really dark sort of places, and I and I just remember having like a continuous six years of a dark place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a continuous five, say five years, from the age of 20, 19 to twenty four. It was pretty dark, um, and then I had a little spell from two thousand eight, two thousand nine to two thousand eleven, where they were pretty bad moments. Um, and I just think probably the lowest I felt, the lowest I felt was, I think, I think what, I, probably around just before, yeah, about 1996, I put on a lot of weight um, and, and I, th I just heard someone say, is that the fat one or the slim one? And I knew it was me, I was the fat one. And I just kind of, I've, I've always, one is, you know, I've always prided myself of having a bit of self-respect and then I kind of like, when you hear someone say that about you, you kind of think, really, is that, they're talking about me there? And I kind of like, again, it kind of fueled me to kind of get myself fit. So within five months, I'd gone from 16 stone to 12 stone. I was training three times a day. But that was probably the lowest period of my life. Um, the lowest period on the table was probably in 2000... 2006, I think, when I walked out against Stephen Hendry, I wasn't enjoying my snooker then. I had a lot of off-the-table personal things going on, and I, and I never really enjoyed playing. Um, and that moment when I walked out of him, I just couldn't take being out there. I didn't like my life. I was very unhappy. Um, yeah, and being under that sort of scrutiny, if you like, um, I just couldn't handle it. And then and I walked out against Stephen Hendry, and uh, but then again, you know that was that was a lesson. I got punished for that, and I just thought, well, don't do that again. And I kind of had to deal with my personal life in a way, so it forced me to kind of a little bit like with the drinking drugs. I had to go to the priory. I had to deal with it. Couldn't continue playing snooker like that. And the personal issues that I'd going on in my life in 2006, I couldn't carry on playing snooker and have them issues going on off the table. So it forced me to deal with that because I wanted to play snooker. That was my job. That's what I do. That's that's. That's, that's something I never wanted taken away from me. So, yeah, that was probably my lowest sort of time in my, my life on the table. If you enjoyed this, if you want more, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.